Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke, ready with an answer. Uh, I'm doing a study on Roman Catholicism. This is part six. If you have not seen the first five episodes, uh, I strongly recommend you go back, watch it from the beginning. Uh, I'll give you like a quick synopsis of what I've covered so far. Um, started off uh, asking the question is why address Roman Catholicism? Why should we even be discussing this subject? Um, should we accept Roman Catholicism as a, another acceptable denomination of Christianity? Or are they flawed enough? that we need to say, no, it's not part of biblical Christianity at all. And the conclusion was, no, it's it's not biblical Christianity at all. And so therefore it is important to, to discuss this and to uh, make the public aware of this. The In part two, uh, the question was, uh, since uh, it's not biblical Christianity, what is it? Uh, does it rise to the level of being a cult? And uh, the answer was yes. Uh, it is a cult. A cult, uh, as I define it, is uh, something that has represented itself and maybe even considered to be part of Christianity, and yet it doesn't hold to the basic core doctrines of Christianity, and therefore it is a false Christianity and a, what I call a cult. And, and, and not only is it a cult, uh, but it is the largest cult in the world. And that's why this particular subject, this discussion here, is so important. Then uh, I went through the origins uh, of Romanism so that people could understand that uh, it did not start with uh, the apostles. And it cannot be traced back to Peter. Uh, it, it's, it started really uh, in the fourth century with uh, the Emperor Constantine and it was uh, Constantine mixed uh, Roman paganism. All the pagan religions, he mixed them with uh, uh, some ideas of Christianity, and that's what you end up with this mess called Roman Catholicism. So I've shown the history of it, the origin of it, and then we asked the question, uh, uh, what about the history of the Roman Catholic Church? Is it something that is to be proud of, or is it, or should they be ashamed of their history? And uh, I discussed the atrocities of the Roman Catholic Church. I, I'm going to call it Romanism for short. So when I say Romanism, I'm talking about the Roman Catholic religion. And uh, I went through uh, some of the atrocities. Uh, and recommended that uh, you read the book of uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs for a more thorough account of uh, the horrible things that the Roman Catholic Church did. And be, if someone varied even slightly in, in their, uh, their teachings, if you had someone who believed in biblical Christianity, as I do, uh, they, would, uh, they would be um, tortured, uh, killed, and their property and wealth stolen. Uh, that was that's the history, and that's well, very well documented. Um, and then we looked at the popes, which uh, are so revered. Uh, they call them the Vicar of Christ. That means that's you're, he's there in place of Christ. He's on the throne, and uh, he's supposed to be infallible and uh, holy. And yet we looked at the history of the popes, of their personal conduct. And they were some of the most evil, horrible characters uh, of history. Um, uh, and then I've gone into this last episode, began discussing the tenets of Romanism, the, the doctrines. What do they believe? And when did that particular doctrine enter into uh, Roman, the Roman Catholic religion? Uh, a lot of people, not only are, will you be surprised to see some of the things that they believe, but he, it should also be uh, surprising to you, I guess, that uh, most of these 
beliefs of Roman Catholicism were not part of the original Roman Catholicism. They certainly were not part of biblical Christianity, according to you know Jesus and the apostles established it. Uh, so these false doctrines, these what we call traditions of men, traditions of the Pope, popes, uh, it's historically like every you know five years or a hundred years or two hundred years they would introduce a new a new uh doctrine a new so i've been going over these things and now i'm at the point where i'm discussing uh, i want to go back and discuss a little further the one that i have already talked about at the very end of last episode and that is the uh Let me see. The Ave Maria. I really, I mean, I, I, I knew Ave Maria is a song, but it's sung in a, a foreign language, so I don't didn't know what it meant. When Brother Bill and I were discussing this recently, he, uh, we decided just to look it up, and the Ave Maria is is nothing more than the the prayer the. Uh, uh, the, the prayer to Mary that Roman Catholics teach uh, to you to memorize and recite over and over with uh, in mindlessly re repetitions, vain repetitions, as Jesus would say. So the, the prayer goes, uh, I remember it from my youth as a young Roman Catholic, uh, Hail Mary, Mother of God. Uh, so Ave Maria is Hail Mary. And so that the song is in Latin, but it's when it's translated to English. It's uh, Hail Mary, Mother of God, blessed art thou among women. Well, the first problem I pointed out is that uh, elevating Mary above other uh, believers is wrong. Uh, and, and then put it, calling her the mother of God is certainly wrong because God does not have a mother. Uh, we know that Jesus uh, was fully God and yet fully man. And it's the humanity of Jesus that Mary was the mother of. She was not the, the mother of his godness because God is eternal and God doesn't have a mother. So calling her the mother of God is certainly a big mistake. So hail Mary, mother of God, blessed art thou amongst women. Well, blessed art thou amongst women is, is, is uh, just a quote from the scriptures when the angel Gabriel was talking to Mary and informing her that she was chosen to give birth to, uh, to Jesus. Uh, so she is blessed among women. Um, Hail Mary, Mother of God, blessed art thou amongst women. Uh, um, hmm. Pray for us. Uh, sinners uh, it's to ask Mary uh, I believe Mary's in heaven I believe she believed in Jesus and she's saved she never asked for this adoration and this elevation that the Romanism has, has uh, given her so she's in heaven and uh, if she's aware that people are praying to her and asking her to pray for, for them uh, then she she must be appalled because uh, she she was never intended to be in that position as like an intercessor. We pray to her and ask her to pray for us. Um, trying to remember it. Hail Mary, Mother of God, blessed art thou amongst women. Uh, pray for us sinners. Oh, I don't remember the rest of it, but it's 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 full of uh, it's full of uh, you know uh, false uh, ideas. Now I'm going to move on now to the, the I discussed briefly the Council of Trent in 1545 that declared that tradition is of equal authority with the Bible. This is one of the main things that uh, Roman Catholics argue uh, that instead of sola scriptura, uh, that uh, uh, scriptures alone is insufficient. 
uh, that uh, it's necessary to also learn from and follow the teachings, the traditions that have come down over the centuries of the church, the Roman Catholic religion through the popes. So everything I've cited here, I've given you dates. In the last episode, I'll continue doing that so you can see when this was initiated. And this idea that uh, uh, tradition is equal authority to the Bible was established 1545 A.D. Uh, it was, uh, by tradition is meant human teachings. The Pharisees believed the same way, and Jesus bitterly condemned them, uh, for by teaching human tradition, they nullify the commandments of God. You can find this in Mark uh, 7, verses 7 through 13. You can find it in Colossians 2, verse 8, and you can find it referenced in Revelation 22, 18. Um, but part of the Reformation, I hate to even use the word Reformation because uh, I'm not what you call a Reformed theologian. Is the, the, the word Reformed has been stolen by Calvinists. And uh, so when I hear some, the word Reformed, uh, almost every time, uh, I I'm going to assume that that person is Calvinistic. And uh, I, I have a long, like, 10 hours teaching against Calvinism that you can find, too, Calvinism debunked. Um, but in the Reformation, the a concept of uh, the, the five solas came out of the Reformation, and that is, uh, sola scriptura is that we go to the scriptures for our truth and our doctrine, not anywhere else. Everything outside of the scriptures, uh, it's, it's certainly uh, okay for uh, all people of varying, even different denominations of Christianity. It's certainly okay to discuss things uh, and express opinions and write uh uh, you know, uh, write books, and ex there's many, many different books that are written trying to explain the scriptures. Uh, but, but we cannot take the uh, the words of any man uh, as a "Thus saith the Lord." We have to look for look at the scriptures for ourselves. Uh, Paul experienced this when he went to Berea and preached. Uh, in the town of Berea, uh, they received Paul's message, and they they thought it was wonderful, but they, they were not going to necessarily just accept Paul's word for it. They had to go to the scriptures themselves and confirm, looking at all the prophecies about the Messiah, confirm that everything that he had said about Jesus being this Messiah who died for our sins and rose from the dead, that confirm that that's all in the scriptures. And that's what being Berean is. You check for yourself. You go to the scriptures for as your final authority uh, but no in, in Romanism they've rejected that and it was declared in 1545 the Council of Trent that the traditions come that came from all the Pope's sayings were of equal authority with the Bible I believe that they even go further and say that it's uh, it, uh, it even supersedes the scriptures because they they've certainly come up with a lot of things that are contradictory to what the scriptures say. Um, now we're going to look at the apocryphal books uh, that were added to the Bible also by the Council of Trent. Uh, these books were not recognized as canonical by the Jewish church. Uh, you can see, see in the scriptures in Revelation 22 verses 8 and 9 referenced uh, to this <clears throat> about adding to or taking away from the scriptures. But the, the canon is established, and um, the, the books that are outside of the canon, and this Bible right here, this happens to be King James Bible. I'm not KJV only. I, I like to look at the King James Bible all the time I, because of its beauty and its accuracy. I always read it. But... Uh, I also like to come when I come to a verse that is not real clear. I like to look at more modern translations 
and even the Greek and see if I can under, understand it better. So I don't limit myself to the King James Bible, even though I use it as my primary source. Uh, but this is the canon. There are 39 books in the Old Testament. There are 27 books in the New Testament that have been accepted as canon. And uh, these are the books that we look, go for our truth, for our learning. And uh, any books that were not accepted as part of this, then I would have to say that um, these books, uh, they're not, I don't think they're forbidden for you to read, but I wouldn't put a lot of faith in, in what they say. They were not put in the, in the Bible for a reason. Uh, it, they were either believed that they were teaching something contrary to the Bible, or the author was or that it was uh, identified with was not truly the author. It was a pseudonym. Someone used a pseudonym so that they could, uh, you know, get, get the book accepted if it was appeared to be written by an apostle. So there's there are various reasons these uh, ap 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 apocryphal books. Uh, extra biblical books uh, didn't make it into the Bible. Um, then now I'm going to look at the the creed of Pope Pius the Fourth was imposed as the official creed 1560 years after Christ and the apostles. Uh, true Christians retain the Holy Scriptures as their creed. Hence, their creed is 1500 years older than the creed of Roman Catholics. Uh, see Galatians 1, verse 8. Uh, I think this goes right along with the idea of the uh, Sola Scriptura. Uh, not only Romanism, but various sects of, uh, of uh, or denominations of Christianity have come up with these creeds. Uh, and I think it's okay to, uh, to establish a creed on, on my channel. Uh, and every one of my videos, I post kind of a creed that I have, that I wrote myself. And But I don't call it a creed. I call it a statement of faith. It's just I want people to know right away, these are my core beliefs. Uh, so I publish that, and I want everybody to know uh, so they know who they're talking to. Uh, but... Uh, these creeds that people have to, you know, recite and, and agree to is that's uh, uh, that's not biblical. The Bible says that it doesn't say anything about us establishing creeds. Uh, there is one verse in the Bible that is uh, became a creed, and that is First uh, Corinthians fifteen three and four, Paul's declaration that uh, he said, "You, if you you've heard the gospel I told you before, that is." that you believe that uh, Christ died for our sins, he was buried, he was raised from the dead the third day, and then he goes on to say that he was seen by all these people. Uh, that's the creed that was established in the beginning of the church as far as it was repeated as this is what we want everybody to understand, that uh, Jesus did die for our sins and he was raised from the dead. Um, but this creed, this of Pope Pius IV, that was established in 1560. Now, the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary was proclaimed by Pope Pius IX, the, the 1834. Um, well, the Bible states that all men, with the sole exception of Christ, are sinners. Mary herself had need of a Savior. The Immaculate Conception, uh, in that, to me, simply means that uh, Jesus was virgin born. Uh, Mary was a virgin when she conceived and gave birth to Jesus. Uh, that's, that's what the, the scriptures tell us, and I accept that as truth. But they, in Romanism, they go a step further and uh, declare that Mary, part of that, it means that Mary was without sin. And the Bible says over and over again, every person. Uh, has, has said there's not one exception and some of the verses you can go to is Romans 323 uh, Romans 5 verse 12 Psalm 51 5 Luke 130 uh, and verse 46 and 47 
Uh, there's many more, but uh, it's clear in the scriptures that every person is a sinner and therefore every person needs the savior, including Mary. So their, their idea that uh, Mary was without sin is uh, that's just a declaration from a pope. It's not in the scriptures. It's contrary to the scriptures. Then we have in 1870, a declaration that um, in the year 1870 after Christ, 1870 years after Christ, Pope Pius IX proclaimed the dogma of papal infallibility. Um, infallibility means that uh, you, not only you, everything you say is correct and true, you never make a mistake. Anything a Pope declares is truth. It's equal equal to the scriptures, it's the word of God, and it's uh, the Pope is infallible, meaning it is impossible for him to make a mistake and be wrong. So uh, this is a blasphemy and the sign of the apostasy and the Antichrist predicted by St. Paul. If you read 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 2 through 12, read Revelations 17, verses 1 through 9, uh, Revelation 13, verses 5 through 8, and verse 18, uh, it talks about these things. Um, but this is, a, this is something I've also seen just even within this YouTube community. I've encountered some people and some people that I've even uh, become friends with and I respect and grown to love. Um, unfortunately, it seems like they are uh, they're almost taking on this uh, belief of infallibility regarding their conclusions. Uh, in other words, what, whatever their position is on any theological question, they, they assume that they couldn't possibly be wrong. And uh, whether it's the Pope or whether it's you or me, we should never consider ourselves infallible. Uh, I, I've proven that, that I'm not infallible because uh, I've, I got saved in December of 1986. I've been reading and studying and teaching the scriptures for 28 years. And some of the positions that I held early on uh, as I matured and learned more, I changed my conclusion. That pr there proves that I am fallible because I made a mistake and now I've changed my mind and I, I think I'm correct now. But that if, it, if, if I have changed my views on several uh, theological questions over the years, that makes me think that well, if I've been wrong in the past, I could possibly still be wrong now about some things. So uh, I, I leave it open to, uh, I, I want to hear uh, opposing ideas. I want to hear uh, all the different theological topics I uh, find interesting and fascinating and worth studying. I want to get it right. It is important to get it right. But I am a fallible human being, and you are too. So if you assume that you've got it right on everything, and then when someone doesn't agree with you, that you're, you must be right, they must be wrong, and, and then you take it to the next level where you want to be dogmatic and, and not allow for another opinion, and even take it to the case where you disassociate with someone because you're right and they're wrong, and you cannot tolerate another opinion. That's where all this leads to. So... The Pope is not infallible, and none of us are. So we just need to go to the scriptures, and even when we go to the scriptures, sometimes we we will read the same thing and come to different conclusions. Um, and the and Pope Pius X in the year 1907 
condemned together with modernism all the discoveries of modern science which are not approved by the church. Pius IX had done the same thing in the syllabus of 1864. Um, well, in, so that was 1907. It says he condemned together with modernism all the discoveries of modern science. Well, isn't, wouldn't it be foolish to, dis, to uh, condemn all the discoveries of modern science? Uh, I don't believe with, in some of the majority uh, viewpoints of scientists today. Uh, I think that the majority of scientists uh, and the more majority of people who have gone through universities, attended universities, have been brainwashed to believe in Darwinian evolution. And if they do believe in Darwinian ev evolution and they're a Christian, they try to make that ex acceptable and that, uh, uh, that it's intelligent design. God used evolution as a means of creation rather than creation as we read it in Genesis. I, that's totally wrong. And it's, it's, I'm sorry, I don't want to offend you, but it's imbecilic to believe in Darwinian evolution. And there's, uh, I'm not going to go try to disprove it in this video. I have uh, videos uh, uh, on my playlist, uh, go, Science God and the Bible, a lot of videos there that prove the case. But if you really understand uh, what science is saying about, uh, about creation, about the universe, about life, uh, you can't come to any other conclusion except that it's impossible for Darwinian evolution to have happened, and that uh, the most uh, the most reasonable explanation, logical explanation, is that there is a designer that created everything intact as it is now. Man did not evolve into this current state. We were created originally just as we are now. Uh, we are a finished product, even though. The fall made us flawed. Uh, we have this sin nature, but in the resurrection, with you know, in our glorified states, uh, that will even be removed. So um, the idea that science is always wrong uh, is uh, introduced in 1907 by Pope the Ninth, that Pius the Tenth. Um, but. Now they've gone so far, the current Pope, I'm probably jumping ahead, but this current Pope, uh, he's gone to the other extreme, and he's teaching that uh, Darwinian evolution is true, and the story of creation in Genesis is just a fable. And that, that it's like, to believe it is to believe that like God is like a magician, and it's, he just did a magic trick, uh, and that uh, how could the, the Pope... The one that's supposed to be the most knowledgeable, infallible person on earth, according to Romanism. And yet, he is just like dismissing the creation account in the scriptures as a fairy tale and that uh, Darwinian evolution is correct. Well, that's how far they've gone in Romanism. Um, in the year 1930, Pius XI condemned public schools. Um, well, it's it's part of being um, part of being a cult is having a cult leader, and the cult leader also has to be um, authoritarian. Uh, we saw that with uh, Calvin. In uh, uh, he he was an absolute authoritarian over the the town that he ruled. Uh, what was that town? I'll think of the name in a minute. But he had a population of fifteen or twenty thousand people, and they had to not only believe exactly what he taught, but he, he even took it to the level where he. Can inspect people's houses, and if there's anything in their house, the way their their dishes or anything that he didn't approve of, then he had authority 
to uh, remove it and change it, and punish people. Uh, and that's that's the, the same kind of thing I'm seeing here with the popes and this authoritarian kind of thing where they're trying to impose the their beliefs on society. But Christianity should not be dictated to people. Uh, certainly should not be forced upon people uh, at the threat of their life as, as Romanism has done throughout history. Uh, when we talk about the, the uh, yeah, Fox's Book of Martyrs, the accounts of all of the torturing and murdering of, of people who didn't conform to Romanism, uh, and we see it happening today. It's happened historically with Islam also. They, they, if they don't can't persuade you, they just will threaten you, threaten your life. And if you do not uh, recant Jesus and uh, and uh, declare that you're uh, a Muslim, they'll kill you, cut off your head. So f forcing someone into your religion uh, is certainly not what the scriptures tell us to do. And even imp imposing our religion on people through laws is, is not what we're supposed to do. Uh, condemning public schools, as the Pope did here in 1930, uh, is not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to just persuade people. We're supposed to tell them the truth, and then everybody has to decide for themselves how they're going to live their life, what they're going to believe, what they're not going to believe. Now, in the year 1931, the same Pope Pius the Eleventh reaffirmed the doctrine that Mary is the mother of God. Uh, this doctrine was first invented by the Council of Ephesus in the year 431. This is a heresy contrary by Mary's own words. Read Luke 1, verse 46 through 49, and John 2, verses 1 through 5. I've discussed that before, but, but this is just in 1931, this Pope reaffirmed that Jesus is the mother of God. Now, uh, it's okay to say Jesus, Mary is the mother of Jesus, but when we say Jesus is the mother of God, as I've said before, that's impossible because God cannot have a mother if God is eternal. And so uh, Jesus has these two natures, the, his humanity and his uh, the part of the Godhead. And in that, in that, that case, in his deity, he's eternal without a mother. Uh, now we go to 1950. Um, the last dogma was proclaimed by Pope Pius XII, and that's the Assumption of the Virgin Mary. Assumption. I don't know what that is. Let me let me look it up real quick. We'll see. Let's just see what Google says the assumption of the Virgin Mary is. Okay, Wikipedia, I'll look at that first. Okay, the Assumption of the Virgin Mary into Heaven, informally known as the Assumption according to the beliefs of the Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodoxy, Oriental Orthodoxy, and parts of Anglicanism, was the bodily taking up of the Virgin Mary into Heaven at the end of her earthly life. Okay, that's what I thought it was. Okay. Well, again, obviously, there's there's nothing in the scriptures. I mean, if a person wanted to believe that, uh, the scriptures do not say that that happened, and it doesn't say it didn't happen. If you go outside of the Bible and you read, read extra biblical writings, perhaps you'll find that somewhere. How much confidence do you want to put in the, uh, extra biblical writings? Uh, or, or how much confidence do you want to put into the... In, into these declarations of these popes. But there's nothing in this Bible that, that says anything about the assumption of Mary. In fact, 
I wish more was said about Mary after uh, Jesus's uh, Jesus's ascension. Uh, but this, the scriptures tell us Mary was at the death of Jesus on the cross. She was there with uh, the other Marys to uh, uh, put uh, give Jesus a proper burial. Uh, but after that, there is no mention of Jesus' mother, Mary. Uh, so we don't know what happened. I'd love to know more about Mary's life after uh, after Jesus' uh, ascension, but um, there's nothing in the scriptures. So, but when the Pope declares it, he, it must be true since he's infallible. Uh, now I'll go on to uh, the, the, the papacy and priesthood. In the Bible, there are no popes or priests to rule over the church. Jesus Christ is our high priest. You find this in Hebrews 3, verse 1, 4, verses 14 through 15, 5, verses, verse 5, 8, verse 1, 9, verse 11. So that's the book you want to go to to understand about Jesus being our high priest, Hebrews. And all true Christians make up a spiritual priesthood. In other words, if you are a Christian, if you're someone who has uh, no longer put your faith in yourself and your ability to get to heaven through personal merit, if you've come to the point where you feel defeated and hopeless and you know that religion cannot accomplish uh, this eternal life in heaven, and you turn to Jesus and put your faith completely in him to provide the salvation for you, you're a Christian. And every one of we Christians, we, we are priests, according to 1 Peter 2.5. So we're the priesthood, all of the believers. Our high priest is Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ has sanctified all Christians who believe on him, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10 and 11. So all priests today are unnecessary and unscriptural. Furthermore, the practice of calling a priest father is forbidden by Jesus Christ in Matthew 23, 9. You know, I, mentioned, I mentioned this earlier. I mean, not only does has Romanism and the popes come up with things that are um, not biblical. Uh, they, they teach non-biblical theology. But they, there is something that is clearly stated in the scriptures, and they do the exact opposite. Here you have uh, Jesus in Matthew 23, 9, telling us clearly in plain English that anybody can understand, at least English in my translation, call no man father. He was talking about us being a spiritual father, not your own, you know, earthly father that you're begotten by, but uh, call man, no man, your spiritual father. And yet, what's the title that a Roman Catholic priest claims? Uh, he, he, he's called father. I've, I've been uncomfortable if I'm ever around a Roman Catholic priest, uh, if I was to talk to him, uh, if his name was, if he was called Father John, I'm not going to call him Father John. I'm not going to call him Father. Uh, he, he, if he believes in Jesus the way I do, he's equal to me. He probably doesn't believe in uh, salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. Otherwise, he wouldn't be a, a Roman Catholic or he wouldn't be particularly a Roman, Roman Catholic priest. So he probably is not even a Christian. And uh, so, therefore, he's not even a priest. And he's certainly not my father. So uh, if I was around a Roman Catholic priest and he was introduced as Father John, and if I'm talking to him, I'm just going to call him John. I'm not going to call him Father. I hope you do the same thing. Uh, there is only one mediator between God and men. That's in 1 Timothy 2.5. Uh, 
So we do not need a Roman Catholic priest to go to so, uh, so that he can go to God on our behalf and uh, forgive our sins in the confessional booth. Uh, all of our sins are already forgiven. There's no reason to, uh, uh, to confess your sins to another person. There's really no reason to even confess your sins continually to God, as some people believe Romans 1.9 teaches. I've talked about that in the past too, but our sins are all forgiven, past, present, and future. We don't need to be obsessed about our sins. Uh, however, you know, if you sin and you realize it and you feel guilty about it and you want to, you know, cry to God over your sin, and uh, that, that's perfectly okay. But don't think that that's necessary in order to have your sins forgiven. Don't think it's necessary for God to you know, accept you back into his fellowship. The Catholic Church teaches that Peter was the first pope and the earthly head of the church. But the Bible never says this once. In fact, it was Peter himself who spoke against being lords over God's heritage, unquote, in 1 Peter 5.3. So Peter was never given this status by Jesus. He was never given this status uh, after Jesus' ascension in the early church. Uh, Peter's, uh, if, if you read Acts, uh, and you see how Peter behaved there. He, he seemed to even be subordinate to, to James in the, in the Jerusalem church uh, for some reason. And uh, it's, uh, he would be shocked if, if he knew what had happened and that this Romanism, this largest cult in the world, refers to him as a, as a pope. Popes do not marry, although Peter did. So popes are forbidden to marry. Roman Catholic priests are forbidden to marry. And yet the scriptures clearly tell us, uh, don't ever forbid people to marry. Is another example of the Romanism declaring something as a rule, uh, and, and it's exactly the opposite of what the scriptures say. Scriptures say, don't call any man father. Romanism says, call the priest father. Scriptures say, don't forbid anyone to marry. Uh, Roman, Romanism declares their priests and pope cannot marry. Uh, scriptures say, do not pray with vain repetitious prayers romanism invent has people vainly repeat mindlessly like robots petite prayers going through these beads the rosary over and over again like in going into a trance just repeating hail mary mother of god over over and over again the lord's prayer uh, it seemed like they they just Go out of the way to whatever scripture says, let's do the opposite. Um, Peter was married, Matthew 8, verse 14, 1 Corinthians 9, 5 are the references. The Bible never speaks of Peter being in Rome. Uh, and so he could not have been the bishop of Rome, which in Romanism, they, they say that the popes were always the bishop of Rome. Uh, and it was Paul, not Peter, who wrote the epistle to the Romans. <laughs> Paul is the one that was communicating with the Romans, that Roman church. So if anybody was going to be the bishop of Rome, it would be Paul, except Paul did not accept any like pastoral positions. He was an evangelist. He was a, a church a planter. And uh, so he'd travel around and he'd start churches and he'd come back and communicate with them and come back and rebuke them when they were going astray, becoming apostate by having false teachings come into their, their congregation, like uh, legalism, Judaism being introduced into the church. So Paul uh, did not, uh, you know, uh, head up a church as a pastor and uh, whether it was Rome or anywhere else. Um, in the New Testament, Paul wrote 100 chapters 
with 2,325 verses, while Peter wrote only eight chapters with 166 verses. In Peter's first epistle, he stated that he was simply an apostle of Christ, not a pope. That's in 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. The Roman papacy and priesthood is just a huge fraud to keep members in bondage to a corrupt pagan church. <clears throat> Well, this author, he makes the point that uh, uh, comparing Paul and Peter, and uh, I think it's a good point, but then some people have exalted Paul to a position. And these are the what I call the paul only you know, the hyper-dispensationalists, and they believe that Paul is the only one that has the, the gospel, uh, that Paul is the actual apostle to the Gentiles, and none of the other apostles should be listened to. Uh, so that's uh, that's a horrible error too, because the fact is, Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles, but not the first. The first apostle to the Gentiles was Peter, when when he was sent to uh, preach to Cornelius and his family, the first Gentile converts. And he preached the same message. He said they believed on the Lord Jesus uh, just as we did. And then they spoke in tongues as evidence of their of their uh, uh, conversion and receiving the Holy Spirit. And at that time, the speaking in the tongues was a, was a sign that was, was shown. You don't have to speak in tongues to, today as a sign of your true conversion, though, as you know, as some, some Pentecostals were teaching. Um, but I, you know, as obviously Peter did not have the status of pope, he would not have accepted the status of pope, uh, and uh, Paul, and, and Paul also, he he, even though he wrote much more and was more prominent as we see in the scriptures than Peter, uh, we can't should not elevate him ab above all the other apostles either. Not only was he not the first apostle to the Gentiles, or the only one, we know Peter was the first. But then all the apostles eventually went out and preached the gospel to the to the Gentiles. We have, we have historical accounts of all these apostles going all over to foreign countries, uh, preaching the gospel, and because of that, being killed. Every apostle was martyred, suffered a martyr's death for, for the name of Jesus uh, in foreign countries, and they were not preaching in Jewish synagogues in Ethiopia or India, they were pre preaching to Gentiles. So all the apostles were apostles to the Gentiles. They all preached the same same uh, gospel, uh, except at the very beginning of the church when James was arguing that Judaism must be retained. Uh, and uh, Paul was arguing that Judaism must be left behind. But once that was straightened out, all the apostles uh, went around the world and they preach the true gospel of salvation to Gentiles. So I would not elevate one apostle over another uh, unless you just like have a fav have your own favorite, but they don't deserve any status. Um, Paul and Paul would have re rejected that. Uh, he, even though he had to defend his status as being a true apostle, because even not only today is he charged with being a false apostle, but even back in the epistles, uh, people didn't want to believe Paul because Paul was telling them, you got to stop practicing Judaism. And so they called him a false apostle. All right. Now, let's look at the source of authority. Uh, with respect to the Bible, Catholics accept the apocryphal books in addition to the 66 books of the Protestant Bible. They also accept tradition and the teachings of the Catholic Church as authoritative and, and at least equal to that of the Bible. Um, with respect to papal infallibility, Catholics believe that ecumenical councils of bishops and the Pope are immune from error when speaking ex cathedra about faith and morals, such as from the chair. That's ex cathedra means from the chair, from the Pope's chair by sole virtue of position or the exercise of an office. And by infallible, Catholics 
mean much more than merely a simple de facto absence of error. It is, it is positive perfection, ruling out the possibility of error. In actuality, Roman Catholicism places itself above scriptures. It teaches that the Roman Catholic Church produced the Bible and that the Pope is Christ's vicar on earth. Catholics also maintain the belief in sacerdotalism, that an ordained Catholic priest has the power to forgive sins. <laughs> see 1 Timothy 2.5 and to see that that's not the case. This, of course, is a false teaching because no one one can forgive sin other than God himself. You'll find that in Mark 2, verse 7. The word of God is the only source of truth, not church tradition. So there's more information about uh, the authority. Uh, I, I believe that the scriptures is my sole authority, my sole source of truth. Now, can I learn things outside of the Bible? Well, some of you watching this now, uh, probably in discussions with you, I've probably learned some things from you. Uh, I've read some things by reading uh, uh, extra biblical books that explain the Bible. Uh, these, uh, what is the word for a book that is, um, I'm having a mental block against that. It's not concordance, uh, but uh, when someone goes through the scriptures and explains it verse by verse, uh, um, those things can be helpful, uh, but uh, they do not uh, supersede uh, or e are equal to the scriptures themselves. So we don't, uh, even though we can learn from other people and other books, uh, we, we test everything by the, the scriptures as best we can, even though uh, I do not understand all of the scriptures. Uh, I've studied it now for many years. I admit that I'm fallible, and I admit I don't understand it all. I wish more people out there watching this now, I wish more of you would understand that uh, uh, you don't understand every verse in the scriptures either. We try to understand it as best we can. We try to, we pray about it, we study it, we research it, we even talk to other people to get their viewpoints on it, and we end up making some conclusions. But uh, no one is infallible, including the popes, and nobody's writings or declarations are equal to or supersede the scriptures themselves. Now, regarding Jesus Christ, Catholicism teaches that Christ is God, but they nevertheless do not believe that Christ's death paid the full penalty for sin, such as they believe that those who qualify for heaven must still spend time in purgatory to atone for sin. Uh, you should go look at John 19, verse 30, Hebrews 10, verses 11 and 12. There's nothing taught in the Bible about purgatory. Catholics diminish Christ's deity as do other cults, but in a different manner. Instead of bringing Christ low by denying his deity, Catholics elevate Mary high in an attempt to make her equal with Christ. This is heresy. Here's the number one problem with Romanism. After Everything that we've talked about up to this point and everything else I can possibly say in the future in this study, the one thing that is the fatal flaw of Romanism is what was mentioned here in this statement. And that is, they do not believe that Christ's death paid the full penalty for sin. I've asked this question to uh, probably scores or hundreds of Roman Catholics. Do you think you're going to go to heaven? And why? If so, if so, why? And if you're a Roman Catholic right now, I would ask you that question. Do you think you're going to go to heaven? And if you, if you do think you're going to heaven, why? On what grounds? On what basis? Why should God let you into heaven? 
every Roman Catholic, except for one recently, that uh, made a comment on, I think it's the first video of this series. Uh, every, every Roman Catholic, if they really believe Romanism, and they, they answer the question according to the teachings of Romanism, they would have to say, well, I'm not sure I'm going to go to heaven because I can't really know if I've done enough. Uh, if I do enough good, if I've uh, done enough religious acts or, or practices of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, I may go to heaven. I've got my fingers crossed. I'm hoping I've been a good enough Roman Catholic. Yeah, so their faith is in themselves. Their faith is in their ability to perform and practice their religion. And they think that's what will please God. That's what will satisfy God. But the scriptures say, no, we, we cannot get into heaven through our own righteousness. We need to receive the righteousness of Christ through our faith in him completely. So the, the difference between biblical Christianity and Romanism, the, the primary difference is that if someone asks me, do you think you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? I would say, I'm confident I'm going to heaven. I do believe I'm going to heaven. I don't, I'm not speculating and thinking that maybe I'll go to heaven or what I, I'm hopeful of going to heaven. I believe I am going to heaven because Jesus promised me eternal life if I would put my faith completely in him. So I, I believe in Jesus Christ as my savior. I don't believe I can save myself. I don't think I'm part of the equation. Uh, I think that uh, um, everything I do uh, is, is, is before uh, I was a Christian is filthy rags in the sight of God. No matter how good I tried to be, it's, it's just these works are like filthy rags because man trying to get justified by their works, God sees it as filthy rags. But after we put our faith in Jesus, as the Holy Spirit transforms us, and, and we start doing good works, not because we're trying to work our way to heaven, but because the Spirit is transforming us and it comes naturally. And, and uh, those things, uh, we will be judged at the what's called the, the judgment seat of Christ or the Bema seat. That's where Christians are judged in order to receive rewards. We don't receive any punishment at the Bema seat. We only receive rewards. Some people will get more rewards than others because they did more good works after they became a Christian. But uh, a Christian, as, as I am, as a biblical Christian, our, our, we do not put our faith in our, our own performance for our salvation. We put our faith in Jesus instead. I believe Jesus uh, only, only Jesus has the ability to get me into heaven. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. He declares he's the only one that can get me into heaven. And I believe it's true. And he also declares that when we believe in him, we will receive eternal life. It's a promise. And I believe Jesus is honest. He's God. He doesn't lie. He'll keep his promise. He said, if I put my faith completely in him, no longer believing in myself and my own ability, that he will give me eternal life in the kingdom of God. So my answer to that question is, do you think you're going to go to heaven? I'm sure I am. Uh, why? On what basis? Because Jesus promised it to me. He's faithful. He is able to do it. He's the only one able to give me eternal life because he, God, he proved it by raising himself from the dead. So he is able, I believe in his ability, his unique ability. He's the only one that has the ability to give me eternal life. And I believe in his faithfulness to keep his promise. So this is the, the deal killer in Romanism. You, you could be wrong on a hundred things that we've discussed already, but this is the one thing you've got to get right. And in, in Romanism, they, it's wrong. They're, they do not have this 
confidence that they're going to go to heaven. Uh, they're not confident in Jesus um, being able to do it or being willing to do it, being faithful to do it. They think that they have got to perform to a certain level in order to qualify. And that's work salvation, and that's heresy from Satan. Uh, now, what about Mary? As I've said in the scriptures, uh, there's very few references to, to Mary. Uh, there, we know nothing about Mary uh, after, I think, the, the final reference to her is uh, at the... Uh, She's there at the burial. At the burial, I think you have the three Marys preparing Jesus' body in the tomb. Uh, she, she was with him at, at the cross. Uh, but I don't believe there's any other references to Mary after that. Now, I'd like to know what happened with the rest of her life. I'd like to know how she died, because everybody dies. Uh, but uh, in Romanism, they believe that she ascended. The, the uh, she is, uh, assumption, I guess she died and then her body was taken up to heaven. But there's nothing in that about that in the scriptures. And Mel Mary was not elevated above anybody else. Even even when Mary and the, the Jesus' brothers and sisters were looking for him one day and he was preaching in a, in a house and, and they interrupted him and said, Jesus, your, your mo mother and, and, and brothers are, are, are outside the they're asking for you. And he he didn't say, oh, it's my mother. I uh, I need to drop everything and, and, and take care and, and uh, address her because she is uh, above everybody else. No, she, she didn't have any higher status than the people he was talking to, all the sinners that he was preaching to, all the believers and disciples at that time, and sinners and unbelievers, whoever he was talking to, Mary was not above them. She was no more important than them. And he said, anybody who believes in me is my mother, my brother, my sister. So uh, every, all believers are equal in the eyes of God. Uh, we're children of God. But in Romanism, they've elevated Mary to a status that is not biblical. The Catholic Church gives honor and adoration to Mary that the scriptures do not. She is readily referred to as holy, the mother of God, and has been dubbed the co-redemptrix, thereby making her an object of idolatrous worship. The rosary has 10 prayers to Mary for each two directed to God. In 1923, Pope Pius XI sanctioned Pope Benedict the 15th's uh, 1914 and 1922 pronouncement that Mary suffered with Christ and that with him she redeemed the human race. And Pope Pius XII officially designated Mary the Queen of Heaven and Queen of the World. Catholics claim not only that Mary was perfectly sinless from conception, even as Jesus was, the doctrine of uh, immaculate uh, conception proclaimed by Pope Pius IX in 1854, but that the reason she never sinned at any time during her life was because she was unable to sin. That's contrary to all these scriptures. Luke 1, 46, 47, Romans 3, 10, 20, verse 23, uh, Romans 5, verse 12, Hebrews 4, verse 4, 15, uh, and 1 John uh, 1, verse 8 and 10. Catholics also believe that Mary was a perpetual virgin, uh, and yet we know that she had other children. Uh, Jesus had brothers and sisters, and, uh, through, and uh, so Joseph and Mary had children together. We're in Romanism, Roman Catholic, Catholic, they believe that they, to counteract that, which shows that Mary was not a perpetual virgin the rest of her life, they say that all the Jesus' brothers and sisters that were referenced in the scripture were uh, uh, stepchildren, that, that Joseph had ma married and had a lot of children before Mary. And that's absurd. There's no, there's no record of that anywhere. And that uh, 
they, they got married quite young. He would have had to have got married even younger and had a wife and a bunch of children for years. It's just impossible. But they have to make up a story like that to uh, support their false claim that Mary is a perpetual virgin. She was a virgin uh, she, um, when she conceived through the Holy Spirit. And, and then after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph had a regular marriage with with sexual intercourse and, and the predict produced uh, offspring, siblings of Jesus. For, so you can see that uh, uh, all these claims here about Mary are easily refuted through the scriptures. She was not sinless because no one is sinless except Jesus. Um, she was not a perpetual virgin because she did have children uh, after Jesus. And that uh, Catholics also believe that Mary was, uh, that she was assumed her body and soul into heaven. Um, that Mary was raised from the dead on the third day after her death. And anyone who refuses to believe this has committed a mortal sin. The consequence of all this veneration of Mary, in effect, establishes her authority above Christ. Rome says, quote, he came to us through Mary, and we must go to him through her, unquote. All this is so obviously idolatrous, one wonders why Catholics take offense when their religious affections are called cultic. Um, they, it's very common in, in uh, Roman Catholic buildings I'm, I'm not going to call it a church but it's filled with statues and there's always a, cha a statue of mary um, people get on their knees before these statues and pray scriptures tell us to to not uh, worship idols that man made these statues are made man-made uh, whether it's whether it's of an animal or a person, it's a it's a it's a figure of that person. We're not supposed to worship; only worship God. Uh, and yet, in Romanism, they pray to Mary. They pray to other what they call saints. They pray to angels. They've elevated Mary to as co-redemptress. In other words, she's the one that redeems us. And you must go through Mary to get to Jesus. And we know we must go through to Jesus to get to the Father. That's in the scriptures. But going through Mary to get to Jesus, that's why they say that Hail Mary prayer. Hail, pray for us sinners. They're asking Jesus to pray for us because we're, we're not able to communicate with Jesus directly according to Romanism. Yeah, so also horribly wrong. Uh, I'm going to end right here. Next time I'll pick up talking more about salvation. But you can see that uh, I'm going to go on and on and on talking about all these beliefs of Romanism and uh, the, showing that they are not only not in the scriptures, but many times they're act actually diametrically opposed to what the scriptures say. Uh, so that's why the popes throughout history and the Roman Catholic religious religion didn't want the public to have the scriptures. And that's why they would talk in Latin so people couldn't understand them in their, their masses, their mass services. Because if people understand what the scriptures say, it becomes real clear that Romanism is not Christ, Christian at all. All right, now, I'm sure if you've been watching this all the way to this point, you can understand that to be truly be a Christian, we must reject religion as a solution. Uh, we must understand that 
you know, uh, man was in trouble with God. So, so God, man could not solve the problem of sin. Uh, even No matter how we tried to be religious, you know, and stop sinning, we couldn't stop sinning. We couldn't do anything about all the sins that have already, um, we've already committed. It's like if every time that we sin, we got a wart on our body, and I have a thousand warts on my body, and I now I decide I'm going to try to stop getting more warts by not sinning anymore. I'm still going to get some more warts because I can't completely stop sinning. And I can't do anything to remove the warts that have already built up on me. And then I, when I go up to heaven, there's a sign that says no warts allowed. I can't get in. So man was in a real pickle. I, he, he couldn't stop sinning. He couldn't. He couldn't uh, remove the sins that he's he's already developed, uh, accumulated in his lifetime, and, and so he couldn't get into heaven through personal merit. So God knew he needed to intervene. Jesus said that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. And his apostle said, well, if, if that's the case, how is it possible for anyone to be saved? And Jesus said, with man, it is impossible. See, with man, it is impossible. God knew that it was impossible for man to solve the problem of sin so that he could be acceptable and come to heaven. But Jesus said, with man, it is impossible, but with God, it's possible. So we need to rely on God as a means of our salvation instead of ourselves. So God took it upon himself to solve the problem. He, Jesus said he came down from heaven. He said the reason he did it was because he would give his life as a ransom for our sins. So he died a horrible death on the cross. All the sins of the whole world were charged against him. All the sins of mankind were placed upon him. He paid for all of our sins. It's called propitiation. The sins of the whole world are paid for. So no man is acceptable and he can come to God because our sins are paid for. And we are free to come to Jesus Christ to receive eternal life. But that's the only way. You can't get it through Buddha. You can't get it through Muhammad. You can't get it through the Pope. You have to go to Jesus. Jesus says he's the only way. Come to Jesus Christ. He paid for your sins. Put your faith completely in him. And he will give you eternal life in the kingdom of God. How do you know he can do it? Because he raised himself from the dead. He proved he has the power over life and death. And he promises you life everlasting if you put your faith on him instead of the, your religion. And your own personal merit will you do it if you if you do it now if you put your faith completely in jesus now he puts the holy spirit of god inside you forever and you're sealed with the holy spirit you never have to worry about losing your salvation and jesus said he will never leave you or forsake you so if you do put your faith in jesus now because now you understand this message this truth about salvation if you do that please make a comment on the video and let me know I'd, I'd be thrilled to hear that so thank you for watching bless you all and please rest in the love and grace of our great Savior God his name is Jesus Christ